Hello friends, I'm on Psalm 100. This is the Messianic Psalms 2. Uh, strictly they're not me Messianic. I'm not going to do 93. I would probably include 101 and 110. Um, I'm not sure, I'm a bit exhausted now, a bit worn out. I've had a, I've had a couple of hours in um, prayer and meditation. I want to take this Psalm 110 and I think it's going to take up my 20 minute slot. Uh, there's so much to get through. What I'm going to do is read through it for you. And then I'm going to give you one or two things you might like to look at. And then I'm going to read it again. And see how you feel when you hear the first read through. In actual fact, then I would recommend you pause it. And think about the psalm that I've just read. Then listen to one or two things that you might like to think about. And then read it again and see if you notice the difference between the two readings. So without further ado, I will read it through. Psalm 110 of David. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy splendour, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest for ever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift up his head. The word of the Lord. Amen. That is the end of Psalm 110, and it is just so full, I hardly know where to begin. I've already spoken about Mount Zion, um, and Mount Zion is the Temple Hill in Jerusalem. So we have Jerusalem, then we have a hill in the Jerusalem. And that is where the Temple is. So we have to imagine that there is a hill and there's a Temple on top of the hill. And that is called Mount Zion. That is God's sacred presence. So whenever we're reading about Mount Zion, this we must picture it as the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the presence. It is in Christ that we have presence with God our Father and not in any other way. You can be at the bottom of the hill. You can be in Jerusalem. You can walk up the hill and be halfway up or halfway down. It's in the Temple Hill, on the Temple Hill, which is in Christ Jesus himself, that you have presence with the Father. Amen. Okay, sorry, that was interesting. I just had to uh, go to the door for the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> wouldn't, you, wouldn't you believe? I was going to invite them in and come and see my study. Um... Okay, so we go to the beginning. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, you, which you will find in Luke 41. Then Jesus said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord, said Jesus. How then can he be his son? Now, this is not so much a mystery as requires, <laughs> as requires understanding. Now, if you go to Matthew 1, you will see the genealogy of Jesus as the Messiah. Um, and to say it's complicated is it is not true. Of course, anyone with half a brain and anyone who is seeking the Lord knows that it's the words that we read in the Bible are words. That is fantastic. 
but it's also the between the lines. And we all know that many a truth is spoken between the lines of the written word. Anyone can put letters together to say anything they choose to say, but the truth is found often between the lines. And the between the lines of the genealogy of Jesus, we can find many examples. Beginning with the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham, we have a father sacrificing his son. And we also have a son offering himself in sacrifice. Make no mistake that when Isaac was about to go under the knife of his father, he was certainly in late teens, probably in his early 20s, he could quite easily have overcome his father or have, or have just run away. He submitted himself unto his father for sacrifice. So we have to read the whole of scripture to understand what this genealogy of Jesus in the flesh is telling us. Interestingly as well, very interesting when you look through that, because quite clearly Joseph was not the human father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we go back to the genealogy all the way back to Abraham. And when we come down here, we have Boaz is the father of Obed, and Obed is the father of Jesse. And here again, we have lots of references in the scripture to um, from the branch of Jesse. Jesse, Jesse, Jesse is also another father figure, the father of David, which brings us to the, the root core, if you like, of Christ being the root and the offspring of David. It's all to do with the paternity of God the Father. But of great significance here that I don't want you to miss is the fact that the mother of Jesse, Obed became the father of Jesse. So Ruth is the grandmother of Jesse and the great grandmother of King David. The important thing to my mind to get hold of here as far as the significance of what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ actually meant and still means is that Ruth was a Moabite. A Moabite was a sworn enemy of God and the Moabites actually came into being when Lot was rescued from Sodom or Gomorrah or wherever he was sitting, Sodom I think it was, when the angels grabbed hold of Lot and his two daughters before they um, sent down fire and sulphur to destroy Sodom. Because Lot was still reluctant to go. He quite liked sitting in the city gate. Lot then argued with the angels and said, please don't tell me to run. I'm not well enough. Send me to this little town called Zoan, which they did. Um, and it's a classic example of giving someone what they want and it turning out to be a disaster for them because then Lot is in this little place called Zoan where there are no human beings and Lot's two daughters take it upon themselves to have sex with him. The Bible says he knew nothing about it. Uh, you know, make of that what you will. And Lot's daughters, one of Lot's daughters has a child, I think it was Ben Ami, you'll have to check that, who later went on to become the Moabites. They are a nation of people born of the most vile incest imaginable. And of course, the fact that this abomination took place with Abraham's nephew is just... You can't imagine anything worse in God's sight than the Moabites. 
So we have Boaz and Ruth who marry. And Ruth, being a Moabite, is brought in to the people of God right back at this time in history. We have God's enemies being brought in by his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. And then Boaz and Ruth give birth to Obed and Obed give birth to Jesse. So Ruth is the maternal ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Ruth's ancestry is one of being outside of the camp as a sinner. Joseph's side is the side of being God's people. And this is extremely important in the whole genealogy of Christ's divinity and humanity. If you're going to venerate anybody, let it not be the mother of God who you venerate. Look to Ruth. Because when we're venerating anyone, it is because of God's grace. We should be venerating God. And of course, Mary, the mother of God, has a wonderfully special place. I shall talk about that in a moment. But we must not venerate anyone. We must not worship anyone. There is no such thing as a saint with a capital S, even Holy Mary, Mother of God, that you can worship. The Lord forbids it. The Father forbids it. Worship only the Lord your God in Jesus Christ. Thank you. I hope I have made that clear. So if you read the genealogy of Christ in Matthew 1, you might want to go and read the book of Ruth and spend some time thinking about that. And what I will say about Mary, um, I would love to see the genealogy of Mary and I scratch my head and I wonder why we don't have it. And you can think, well, you know, in those biblical times, women were like chattel. Um, and these are all human concerns. So when I thought about it, it, it more deeply, it struck me that sometimes it doesn't matter. It does not matter what's gone before. And there is no greater time for that than when we are born again. It really doesn't matter what went before. Now, clearly, we know Mary was but a child. I think she was 12 years of age when she conceived the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, when... <laughs> when Jesus was incarnate in Mary. Um, and it really doesn't matter. We know she was holy. We know she was pure. We know she was chosen by the Lord before the creation of the world, before um, it all took place. Mary was going to be that person. And by goodness, does she have a special place in eternity as the mother of God. There is absolutely no doubt about that. None whatsoever. But she must not be worshipped. You must not go through an intermediary. Because Christ died to be our intermediary. And you would just nullify everything that he did by saying you have to go through Holy Mary or through a saint or through a Catholic priest or any other priest, then Jesus dying on the cross would have been completely in vain. So when we are born again, when we receive the Holy Spirit, it's not an insult whatsoever to say that well what went before is of no consequence uh, because it isn't and we don't get Mary's genealogy why do we need it she's the mother of Christ <laughs> we don't need to know what would it matter what would it matter if she was the queen of Sheba it really does not matter what went before whether it was good or bad or indifferent when we are born again. 
surely we can all say we have given birth to the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus Christ has been given birth through us. Oh, I wish, I pray that you fully come to understand this wonderful truth. We are born of the womb of Jesus Christ. Then we have, your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendour, etc. This is quite clearly a reference to Revelation, when the Lord will come with his young men, like dew from the morning's womb. Um, this is on the day of battle, when the Lord comes in his second coming with his bride, which is his church, and we are his church, everyone who belongs to Christ is a stone in the temple. We are the church, Christ is the cornerstone. So this is referring to when the Lord comes again with his bride. When you go to Revelation and the multitude of, of people dressed in white, these are the Lord's... Um, people arrayed in holy splendour. Then we come to the priest um, Melchizedek. And you will find references to this great high priest uh, in Genesis 14, 17 and Hebrews 5 to 7. Again, it's the priest without mother or father, without beginning or without end. And we must have a high priest who is both divine and human. And Melchizedek is mentioned here. I think again to remind us of Abraham and Isaac. That Jesus Christ consented to be a sacrifice. God came in the flesh and it was the very birth, death, burial, resurrection and ascension to heaven to sit at God's right hand which gave Jesus the authority to rule and reign in heaven and on earth everything in the universe. Christ consenting to be this sacrifice and going through human life is what makes him to be our great high priest. Because in being obedient unto death, the Father purposed for him that he would put everything under his feet. And Christ accomplished God's purpose in doing so. Now the Holy Spirit who indwells us as God purposed that he would, has experience of living as a human being and can truly counsel us as a great high priest. Uh, quite quickly, there's so much in here. Uh, he will judge nations, heaping up the dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ told us in the Gospels that he didn't come to save the world, uh, to judge the world, he came to save the world. You will find that in John 12, uh, 47. It also says elsewhere in the Gospels that he will judge the world. In Matthew eleven twenty five, Jesus says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. And this is again to do with the authority of the Lord Jesus as the great high priest. And that when he comes again, he will judge the world and everybody in it because the father has given him authority again this is a reference to abraham and isaac uh, in genesis 22 and um, we can also go back to moses um, in exodus 2 14 when moses when moses killed the egyptian and the crowd who um the the crowd who were there said who made you ruler and judge over us and of course Moses then fled um, but they 
came to understand indeed that it was God who made Moses ruler and judge. And we will come to know those who do not believe that Christ is ruler and judge in this age and in this generation. Well, when the time comes and the Lord Jesus Christ comes again in his second coming, which is not an if or a maybe, but a certainty, those who scoff now and say, well, who made you ruler and judge? We don't believe in you. Well, then they will know that it was God the Father who gave authority and dominion to Jesus Christ, his son. So now is the time to be saved from that judgment. Now is the time to get to grips with the scripture. Now is the time to get off the fence, to decide who your God is. And I heartily recommend that you go through the Bible and that you look to the bronze snake in Numbers 21. For all who looked upon the bronze snake were saved from death. That's a peculiar scripture because throughout Numbers uh, and all of the Old Testament, we are told that God abhors idols and we have the golden calf and anything that is made with human hands. <laughs> and then we come to this passage where God is absolutely furious with the Israelite community for the sin that has taken place, not for the first time. And he has compassion on them and tells Moses to put a bronze snake and anyone who looks at the bronze snake, he will spare them from death. That is a direct reference to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Father had already purposed that all who looked to Christ would be spared the death that in his judgment they deserve. That's you and me and everybody else deserves the sentence that God the Father has put upon us. That is not in doubt. And we are told to look to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Israelites were told to look at the bronze snake. Look toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way we look towards him is to read his word, to get to know him, to want to know him and at the appropriate time to make your confession and to ask him for salvation. I pray that you do it today. I love you. The end. <laughs>